Yeah. We're going to have enteral endocrine cells. So endocrine cells tell us that they produce hormones. Entero is a word that is a reference to the digestive system. So enteral endocrine cells or endocrine cells that are unique to the digestive system. So, and we're going to see that name several, several more times as we're going through it. And so in, in the digestive system, what the common way in which we identify the cells is to look at the enzyme. So in this is, excuse me, look at the hormone. So in this, this is, this, the hormone is gastrin. And so we're going to call the cells G cells using the first letter of gastrin to indicate the cells. So G cells produce the hormone gastrin. And then eventually we're going to talk about what the role of the hormone is in more detail, but kind of as an overview for right now, the hormone gastrin is going to help us produce and control the production of hydrochloric acid. And so we don't want to produce hydrochloric acid at a constant rate if our stomach is not empty. So what we want to do is we want to be able to turn on and off the production of hydrochloric acid based on whether there's content in the stomach. And so gastrin is, our, is actually our hormone that's going to help us control the production of hydrochloric acid. And then pepsinogen uh, is the precursor enzyme that's going to be converted to pepsin by hydrochloric acid. And it's going to begin to break down protein. So at this point in our discussion, we've talked about carbohydrates beginning to be digested in our mouth, lipids being beginning to be digested in our mouth, and then now in our stomach, because of the hydrochloric acid and the strong acid content, the amylase that starts the digestive carbohydrates stops working. Uh, light base that was produced in our mouth stops working, and now we begin the digestion of proteins uh, in the stomach itself. Okay. So then the other compound that parietal cells produce besides hydrochloric acid is intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor is critically important to the absorption of vitamin B12. And so we see that in elderly populations where if you do, uh, oftentimes if people are B12, they become anemic. So one of the reasons why elderly people become so anemic is their B12 levels drop. And one of the reasons that happens in elderly people is we get a decreased production of intrinsic factor with age, which decreases our, our, our ability to absorb B12. And so you have to do B12 shots in some instances because you can't absorb B12 anymore uh, because of the low amount of intrinsic factor. Uh, and then, as I said, gastrin is a hormone that's going to control the release of hydrochloric acid. Uh, and a couple of other things we're going to discuss later after we've talked about all the organs. So the small intestine is what's attached to the to the stomach. And the small intestine, as we as we looked at in lab on Thursday, is heavily coiled up so that we get this fairly large small intestine that we can compact into our abdominal cavity. And we divide the small intestine into three regions. The duodenum, which is what attaches to the stomach, and that's the shortest region. The jejunum, which is in between, and it's going to be a transition from digestion to absorption. And then the ileum, which is largely absorption, which is actually the largest portion of the small intestine. And then the ileum is what attaches to the large intestine. And we move food through this tube via the rhythmic contractions of smooth muscle again. Uh, which is involved in, which is peristalsis again, that we talked about last time. And then, as I showed you in lab on, on Thursday, what maintains the organization of the small intestine is a sheet of connective tissue that's attached to it, which is called a mesentery. And then the mesentery attaches to a sheet of connective tissue that's associated with the large intestine called the mesocolon. And so these two sheets of connective tissue are all intertwined together. And the mesentery attaches toward the center of the mesocolon so that it attaches to the small intestine, the entire length of the small intestine, and keeps it in place inside of the, of the large intestine. So this is actually a cadaver that you're showing 
that relationship. So what we're seeing is the mesocolon here and here, and then you can see the mesentery as it's attached to the small intestine as the small intestine is being uh, separated and pulled apart. So the duodenum is the shortest region of the, of the small intestine, about 25 centimeters long, or about 10 fingers. Uh, and it continues the digestion of carbohydrates. And to continue to the digestion of carbohydrates, two things actually have to happen. One is we have to make a big shift in pH. And so we wanted the stomach to have a very, very acidic pH, a pH of about two, that allowed us to kill microorganisms associated with our food and liquefy food. And so the stomach pH has to be two to to accomplish those two feats to make sure that most microorganisms have been killed and that we can liquefy food. As the, as the material from the stomach that we now call chyme is going to enter the duodenum, we have glands in the duodenum that produce a, a mucus that's more basic, and we have products from the liver and the pancreas that are going to be added to the duodenum that contain bicarbonate. And so what we're going to do is we're going to convert the chyme that's coming out of the small uh, out of the stomach into the small intestine at about pH 2 to above 7, about 7.2. And that can reactivate the amylase that was secreted by the salivary glands. Plus we're going to add new amylase uh, from the pancreas help us digest carbohydrates, and then some secondary uh, enzymes that we're going to talk about in the future that help digest carbohydrates. We're going to continue the digestion of protein, but capsin, which started in the stomach, required hydrochloric acid and required it to be acidic. So what's actually going to happen is as the chyme exits the stomach, capsin is going to be inactivated. And so the pancreas is going to produce an, uh, several other protein digesting enzymes so that we can continue the digestion of protein. And the pancreas is also going to add more lipase, which is going to help us digest lipids. So we're going to begin the digestion of all of our major biological molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. And we actually have to destroy the cells and liquefy the food to free up DNA. And then the acid is going to alter uh, the, the form in which DNA exists in, and it's called, we're going to cause it to uncoil, and that's actually going to help us digest it. So we have to expose the DNA to acid first, and then we have to have enzymes that are going to be secreted uh, by the pancreas that are going to help us digest DNA. Uh, and so the major role of the duodenum is to try to complete the digestive processes of the major uh, molecules that we took in uh, through the process of ingestion. And then uh, the pancreas is going to help with that process, and then the liver is going to help with that process. And then what we have is we have a, a place where the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct come together. So if we're looking at the wall of the duodenum here, then what we're going to have is uh, the common bile duct coming down from the liver. And then the pancreatic duct coming from the pancreas. And then what they're going to do is they're going to come together and they're going to form kind of a face-shaped common duct uh, that's right in the wall of the pancreas. So since it's vase-shaped, it's called an ampulla. So this little ending here is called the ampulla. And then what they do is they use a word to describe it that tells you it's going to have a duct coming from the liver. So hepato is a reference to liver. And then pancreatic. So hepato, pancreatic, and hula. And that name is descriptive, so it tells us that the common bile duct coming from the liver is going to become part of this. 
and then the pancreatic that coming from the pancreas is going to become part of this. And that's how the, the, the stuff from the pancreas and the liver actually get into the small intestine is through this ampoule. And we're going to look at that in more detail when we look at the liver in the lab. So the duodenum is the middle portion of the small intestine. And it's about three to four feet long uh, in cadavers because the smooth muscle is no longer contracting. Then it can be up to eight feet. It almost doubles in length uh, because the, the, the longitudinal muscle fibers are no longer contracting in the small intestine. And so what the duodenum is going to be responsible for is completing the process of digestion of our major biological molecules, carbohydrates, and proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. And then the ileum is the longest region of the small intestine, about two meters or six feet in a living person, and it can double in size and length again when the small intestine smooth muscles no longer contracting in a cadaver that's about 12 feet long. And what it's going to do is make a big conversion from digestion, uh, which is what the jejunum and the duodenum were involved in, into absorption. So both this digestive process and this absorptive process are going to require surface area. So what we're going to see in the small intestine again is this amazing array of ways to increase surface area. Okay. So when you look at the small intestine and you open it up, and we talked about this in the lab on Thursday, then we have these big ridges that we can see uh, which are here, which are called plique circularis. And so we have the plique that we can see. And uh, those are, are ridges that we can see with our naked eyes. So if we were looking at a cross-sectional view, like along this edge right here, then what we would see with the small intestine would be these really large folds that we can actually see that are repeated in a very uh, predictable pattern with the small intestine itself. And then on that, what we would see is we would see that the mucosa, the lining, has upward folds that are covering it. So that as we were going around the, the plique circularis, we would see these upward folds. And that's what they're demonstrating here. So the upward fold, each fold is a villus. And that increases the, the surface area that you post that. And then the last thing we would see is that if you were looking at this pattern of the upward folds, there's a real predictable line at which the folds stop. But every once in a while, at the bottom, you would have this downward fold that goes really deep below that. And so that's what they're depicting here, is these downward folds. And those are called creeps, crypts. So, so we have clique circularis, which are these really big upward folds of the wall. We have upward folds of the lining or the mucosa, which we call villi. And then we also have downward folds of the lining or mucosa, which we call crypts. And so they're called the crypts of, of Libra. And so we have this pattern of repeated folding to greatly increased surface area that, that we're going to see. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at in the lab tomorrow, is we're going to look at histology and look for this pattern of folds. So the reason why we fold the mucosa upward into villi and then fold it downward into crypts is it increases uh, total cell population and then we can have a varied cell population. And then what we're going to see is the cell population is pretty, uh, is not randomly organized, but, but organized in, in a very effective manner. So at the top of each of our villi, we're going to have cells that whose apical surface is also highly folded. Okay? So if it's a big fold like this of the mucosa, we call it a villus or villi. 
and the lining is going to be simple columnar epithelium. So what we're going to have is these columnar cells that are in a single layer. And at the top of the villi, the apical surface of the columnar cells is highly folded. And so when it's a fold of a membrane, we call it a micro villus or villi. So notice in the picture here that the cells at the top of our villus, this big upward fold of the mucosa, uh, contain cells that have these microvilli. So what we're doing with the villi is increasing the number of cells that are lining the lumen. And then what we're doing with microvilli is increasing the apical surface area of cells that are at the tip of the villi. And then these are our absorptive cells. And so these are the cells that are actually going to absorb the, the end products of digestion. So what we want to do is increase our surface area for absorption with microvilli. Then we're also going to see that in the duodenum and in the jejunum, these microvillated cells also produce some enzymes that are going to help us digest. So again, the key to keeping ourselves healthy is to make sure we don't self-digest because our cells are made up of the four biological molecules that we're digesting, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So we have to keep ourselves covered with a layer that prevents digestion from occurring. So we're also gonna have a lot of cells that produce mucus. So again, the mucus producing cells are called goblet cells. And then what's really kind of cool is that the mucus is a is a modified lipid-like material. Right? And so if you recall, we have to have a we have to have a a gene that's going to control the end, that's going to make an enzyme that make allows us to make the lipids. And then we're going to make the lipids on smooth ER. As we make the mucus, we're going to package it with Golgi apparatus, and then these packets of mucus are then going to come to the surface of the cell to be released. So when you look under a microscope, goblet cells are easy to identify because we see these big excretory vesicles containing mucus inside the cell itself. So you get these cells that look like they have these big open spaces in them, which are all these little excretory vesicles containing the mucus itself. So tomorrow in the lab, we, we, we'll be able to see that uh, and see goblet cells really well. All right. So as we move down the lumen, uh, from the lumen toward the wall, down this villi, uh, as we get into the crypts, the crypts of Lieberkuhn, we're going to have two types of cells. So we're going to have enteroendocrine cells again. And so these enteroendocrine cells are going to secrete hormones again that are going to regulate the digestive process. And so within the small intestine, we have cells that produce a hormone called secretin. So what's our pattern? What are we going to call these cells? If they secrete secretin, they're going to become what? S cells for the first letter, secretin. And then we're going to produce a compound <coughs> called cholecystokinin. Uh, and the name is from our early understanding of it. Cholecystal is a reference to gallbladder. Kinin is a re reference to activity. And so the hormone itself is named because we understood it to cause gallbladder contraction. Uh, and so cholecystal kinin simply literally translates to, to active at the gallbladder. And so when we have a complex hormone, we take the three parts of the word and we use the the first letter of all three parts of the word. So coli, so C, cysto, C, kinin, and K. So this hormone, the acronym for it is CCK. So the cells are going to become, the cells that secrete are going to become CCK cells. Okay. And then uh, we also produce a hormone called glucose-dependent insulotrophic peptide. And so we're going to use the first letter of each part of the word. So G, D, I, P. 
uh, for that hormone as an acronym as well. And then clear at the bottom of our, our crypts of lubricant, we're going to have cells that produce lysosomes that help us uh, take care of any bacteria that still might be active uh, in the lumen of the small intestine. So they secrete lysosomes, which are phagocytic, and help us take care of any bacteria that might have escaped through the stomach itself. All right. Then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about these in, these hormones in more detail uh, as we as we continue our discussion after we've talked about all the organs of the digestive system. And the one they didn't the, the one they didn't list for these interendocrine cells is gastric inhibitory peptide. So it's also produced it's also produced by one of these inter you know endo, 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 endo and so, so what's our acronym for that one going to be? GIP, yeah. So the cell is going to become GIP. That's a cool pattern. So once you see that pattern, then it'll, it'll help you understand uh, how, how we use acronyms instead of, instead of saying the whole thing. Okay. So at this point, what we've done is we've ingested food. We have used our teeth and our saliva to break big chunks of food into small chunks of food and use our tongue to tie it together into a, a ball of food we call a bolus. And the bolus is simply transported through the pharynx and the esophagus into the stomach. And as the bolus enters the stomach, then hydrochloric acid is going to take those finer chunks of food that we made with our teeth and completely liquefy the food. And the stuff that's going to come out of the stomach then is called chyme. Okay. And then our large, our small intestine then is going to complete the digestive processes and begin the absorptive processes. And then the next place it's going to go is going to go to the large intestine. And then in the large intestine, we're going to use bacteria to help us complete some digestion. And we're going to continue the absorptive process till we get everything that we can absorb and digest out of it. And then we're going to convert the chyme to a semi-solid mass of undigestible material called, called feces. And then we're eventually going to eliminate the feces. Right? So in that process, uh, it requires quite a bit of 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 control either via hormones or via the nervous system itself. So when we're looking at the upper part, which is the ingestion component, uh, the swallowing component, and in the activity of the stomach, uh, liquefying the food in the kind, and then releasing it to the small intestine, we can actually divide that aspect into three parts of, of digestion. Uh, and so we have a cephalic phase, and then we're going to have a gastric phase, which involves our stomach, and then we're going to have an intestinal phase that involves a small intestine. Okay. So in our gastric, and then when you're looking at this, then solid lines represent hormone control, and then dashed lines represent uh, stimulatory hormone control, and then dashed lines represent uh, uh, stimulatory inhibitory hormone control if they're red, and then blue lines represent neuro control, uh, stimulatory neuro control if they're solid, and then inhibitory neuro control if they're dashed. So red lines represent hormones, solid lines represent stimulatory or increase in activity. So remember when we did the nervous system, we used two acronyms to think about the interaction between neurons together. So we created the IPSPs or EPSPs. So an EPSP was an excitatory postsynaptic potential, and an IPSP was an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So that's what the blue lines represent. EPSPs that are solid lines, and IPSPs which are dashed lines. And then the red lines represent hormonal control. All right. 
So what initiates this is the cephalic phase is the sight of food, uh, the smell of food, and then eventually the taste of food that engages us into the process of, of ingestion and then the thoughts of food. So, so those things are all incorporated into visual stimuli, auditory stimuli, and, uh, and olfactory stimuli initially, and then taste itself, gustatory, uh, afterwards. And so that's all moderated by our cerebral cortex, the surface of our brain, uh, and then the hypothalamus. So just as a quick review, remember our feeding center and our, our center that tells us we're, we're full is all in the hypothalamus of the brain. So the hypothalamus of the brain controls the process of eating. Uh, and then what it's going to do is send signals via the medulla. Uh, and what it's going to do is engage the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and the cranial nerve that goes to the stomach and the small intestine is the vagus nerve. And so the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, is how the signal is going to go from your brain to the organs itself and stimulate activity. So, so what happens is the cephalic phase engages us in the process of, of ingestion. It also stimulates the production of saliva so that we can bind the food into a bolus after we process it and then engages in the process of deglutition or swallowing. Okay. So that's all in the cephalic phase of this activity. All right. So once food hits our stomach, then we're going to cause the stomach to be stretched, and that initiates the gastric phase uh, of the process. And so the cephalic and the gastric phase can be working simultaneously if you've got food in your stomach and you're still eating. So it's, it, it can be engaged simultaneously. So in the gastric phase, we have stretch receptors that are going to detect the dist distension in the stomach. And we're also going to have chemoreceptors that detect the change in pH. So again, to keep bacteria from being able to survive in our stomach, we try to keep a pH in our stomach of around pH 2. So there are a couple of bacteria, uh, heliobacter, that actually survive in a pH of two. And about 20 years ago, a gastroenterologist who had been doing some research on ulcers wrote a paper that he thought most, most ulcers were created by bacteria. And when he presented it at this meeting, everybody laughed him out of the place and told him he needed to do a new job that he was a good. And then through further research, he was actually able to identify and isolate the bacteria. And now we can use antibiotics to resolve ulcers because of his work. So what we do then is we maintain the pH of the stomach to prevent the bacteria from actually causing ulcers to occur. So as you put more basic food into your stomach, then the pH is going to increase. Right? So one of the things about this unit is making sure that we kind of understand pH so that when we're talking about it, because it's presented in different ways, all right, so we could do it the pH number, which uh, pH of one to pH of seven to pH of 14. Then basically, the number system, if you're between one and seven, we say it is acidic. And if we're between seven and 14, we say it is basic, okay. The whole number system comes from the amount of hydrogen ions in solution. Okay. So at neutral, with the pH 7, uh, water dissociates to form hydrogen ions plus a hydroxyl ion. And at pH 7, the concentration of hydrogen ions is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. So the, the, the number for pH comes from, from this exponent, 7. So as we go this way, what we're going to do is we're going to increase the hydrogen ion concentration. So in really, really strong acids, 
then the hydrogen ion concentration is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 1. As we go the other way, we're actually going to decrease the hydrogen ion concentration. And so when we get to a pH of 14, then the hydrogen ion concentration is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And then what's going to go on is that this concentration is going to be the opposite. So if the hydrogen ion concentration is getting larger, the hydroxyl ion concentration is getting smaller. So over here, if the hydrogen ion concentration is getting smaller, then the hydroxyl ion concentration is getting larger. Which is why when you buy Drano, because your drain stopped working, and you read the active ingredients, it is sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And it just dissolves everything. So how it cleans your drain. All right. So when we say increase pH, we're actually talking about making the number larger. So when, when you say an increase in PEA, we're actually talking about making a solution more basic. If we talk about decreasing of pH, we're talking about making a solution more acidic. It's something that can be confusing sometimes. So if we're increasing the pH, we're going to make the solution more basic, which is going to stimulate the production of more gastric juice to return it back to a very acidic pH. <coughs> Alright, so once we've liquefied the food and the food has been converted to kind, then we're going to empty it via the polar sphincter right here. And as that food enters the small intestine, then we engage, then we engage in the intestinal phase uh, of the process. So again, it's going to be stretch receptors that are going to be stimulated because we're going to get an increase in stretch of the wall of the small intestine. And we're going to add chemoreceptors again. But instead of responding to pH like they did here, they're going to respond to either the presence of, of the breakdown products of fat, fatty acids, or the presence of breakdown products of carbohydrates, glucose. And then that's going to stimulate the process. Okay. So we have three phases that are going to be modulated by the nervous system via the parasympathetic nervous system and or hormones that we haven't talked about. Okay. So, so what actually happens is as, our, as we enter the gastric phase and the stomach becomes distended because food is entering it, so the stomach wall is being stretched, or we get this shift in pH where the pH becomes more basic, then that's going to cause G cells to release gastrin. And then gastrin is going to increase the production of hydrochloric acid. So we're going to get an increase in gastric juice, which is going to increase or decrease the pH. Decrease. Decrease. That's why I'm so if we decrease in pH over here, increase in pH going that way. So as we produce hydrochloric acid, the pH of the cell is going to lower, be lower or decreased, right? All right. So we're going to get this increase in gastric juice, which is allow us to liquefy the food, kill all of the organisms. And also, gastrin is going to trip the, uh, it's going to target the smooth muscles in the wall of the stomach to be more active. So we're going to get a more rapid peristaltic movement in the stomach, which is going to churn the food in your stomach. So what you need with the stomach, which we're going to see tomorrow in lab when we're doing the histology, is that throughout the digestive system, starting with your pharynx all the way to your anus, we have two layers of smooth muscle. One that runs the length, the 
one that runs the long axis, so we call it horizontal smooth muscle, and then one that runs around the diameter of the digestive system, so we call it the circular smooth muscle. And that allows us to move food through the digestive system. The stomach has a third layer that runs at an angle to those two, so it's called the oblique layer. So the stomach is unique and it has three layers of smooth muscle. And that allows the stomach actually to rip and churn. And that's why your stomach gurgles sometimes, because it's it's actively moving things around it. And if there's little air pockets in there, it gurgles. Right? So that's called gastric peristalsis. So uh, what happens then is we've got this increase in hydrochloric acid and we've got this increase in liquefaction occurring, so we're converting our food to chyme. Then as the chyme becomes pure liquid, it moves through the pylorus and into the small intestine. And then we're gonna get these stretch receptors in the lining of the small intestine and chemoreceptors that are gonna cause the release of secretin, which is from the S cells, and CCK, which is from the CCK cells. And what they are going to be is inhibitory on the stomach. So what the small intestine wants to do is control the emptying of the stomach and the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach so that you don't overwhelm the small intestine with, or with products entering it. So CCK and secret are going to be inhibitory on gastric peristalsis and the production of, of uh, of, of hydrochloric acid. So as the stomach becomes completely empty, then eventually what's going to happen is we're going to decrease the activity of the stomach. As the small intestine becomes completely empty, we'll decrease the activity of the small intestine. And then what's going to initiate this whole process again is if you ingest food again or think about food. And then that will initiate this whole sequence of events. Which is really good. Right, so to process food material, it requires a tremendous amount of water and mucus for us to do it. So over the course of a 24 hour day, we produce one liter of saliva. So if you think about a graduated cylinder in chemistry lab, one liter. So if we spit all our saliva out all day long, we can fill that liter of, of with saliva, all right? But what we do with it mostly is swallow it, all right? So the saliva ends up in our stomach. We normally ingest about two and a half, two to two and a half liters of fluid a day, either by drinking and or within the food itself. Uh, and so at this point, we essentially have three and a half liters of material coming from above the stomach, entering the stomach. Over the course of 24 hours, we actually produce two liters of hydrochloric acid. So we fill two graduated cylinders of hydrochloric acid. And that's in addition to the three liters we put in our stomach. So now we're up to five liters of liquid, plus five liters of liquid that are passing through our stomach. So as food enters the small intestine, then we have a liver that's gonna help us process food. And then we have a pancreas that's gonna help us process food. And so the liver and the pancreas dump products into the duodenum. So over the course of 24 hours, we produce about a liter of bile that eventually can enter the small intestine. And we produce about two liters of pancreatic juice that air in the small intestine. All right. So we also have those goblet cells associated with the lining of our, of our small intestine, and they produce about a liter of intestinal juice a day. So at this point, we have 9.3 liters of liquid that have either been ingested and are created by your own body that are going to be be entering the lower portion of the small intestine, the ileum, and then eventually into the large intestine. 
So the role of the ileum is to reabsorb about 8.3 liters of liquid per day. So of most of the fluid that we ingest and produce to help us with digestion, we have to recycle. We absorb it through our ileum, put it back into our blood to help us maintain water balance in our body. And then the large intestine, with its unique pattern of hostra, and the way we talked about in the lab on Thursday of how we move stuff around in one hostra, move it to the next one, move it around, move it to the next one, move it around. We're going to absorb almost another liter, which leaves us about 100 mLs of fluid in feces. So if you don't do this, then your fecal material becomes more watery and more watery. And so as your fecal material becomes real watery, we say someone has diarrhea. So certain diseases are, that cause diarrhea, so bacterial infections are, or parasitic infections are the classic example worldwide, uh, can lead to death because you no longer absorb this amount of water so you're constantly losing water. And if you don't, if, and you can lose so much water through, uh, through uh, this process that you cannot physically drink enough water to compensate, particularly if you're nauseous while you're doing it. So cholera is the killer worldwide. Uh, and so when Haiti had the, the really bad earthquake, uh, they didn't have clean water so cholera became a real problem. And elderly people and, and small babies can die within a week uh, when they have cholera because they can't ingest enough water to compensate for the amount of water you're losing with, with diarrhea. So what do we do if somebody's in really bad condition? We use IVs. And so that's the key, is you can save somebody from a death in cholera if you have Healthcare with and the ability to give IVs to recover water loss. If not, then it, it becomes a real problem. So that's always something to think about with small kids and and, um, and elderly people. So if small kids have diarrhea, and but they can ingest water, what are you supposed to give them? Something like Pedialyte. Something like Pedialyte. Why not just tap water? <laughs> yeah, because not only are you losing all this liquid. But you're losing a bunch of uh, electrolytes in your in your in your diarrhea. So if you can't replace the electrolytes, then you're going to be in serious trouble. So with small kids, you get them Pedialyte. Then with elderly kids, geriatric people, then you give them Pedialyte. You can just call it Geriolite. <laughs> and you keep them alive. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing to think about. If you don't have 100 ml of fluid in your feces, and your feces gets really, really hard, and we say you are constipated. Yeah. Based upon our absorption of this. a very circuitous route around our abdominal cavity. So the ileum enters the large intestine right in here. So we have this kind of blind sac that's below the level of the inner. We call this a cecum. And then usually what we have extending off our cecum is an extension like this, which is the appendix. Now in most people, the appendix is down here. But in some people, the appendix is a little higher. Uh, it was actually a, a former student of mine that was a medic out at Fairchild. And uh, he was taking the class. 
and one weekend they had maneuvers and he was out on maneuvers and one of the guys that was on maneuvers got really sick and the guy kept complaining of, of pain but it's still being real low in his lower right quadrant it was really high and the guy kept thinking every sign I'm seeing is saying appendicitis with pains in the wrong place so he calls the doc that's on call and he says you know I got this guy if the pain was lower I'd be saying appendicitis let's get him out of here and but the pain is too high and the doc says well bring him in anyway sure enough his appendix was clear up here <laughs> and it was really inflamed and if he hadn't gone with what he thought was everything's telling me this should be it but something's wrong the guy could have died something amazing so the appendix is not always where it is so you talk to surgeons and they'll say wow it took me about a half an hour to find that appendix because it wasn't down here where it was supposed to be so we're all genetically unique so we always have to keep that in mind when we learn anatomy we learn a model at which most of us fit to some extent, and, but we all have these peculiarities that are, that are part of it. So then what we do is we identify the large intestine based upon the direction of material flow. So since the, the, the kind is going to go upward here, we saw, call this the ascending colon. Then it makes a curvature here. And this curvature is, is associated with the liver, so we call this the hepatic curvature. And then the material goes this way, so we call this the transverse colon. And then partway through the transverse colon, we're going to convert the kind to feces. So we're going to end up with feces in our transverse colon. And then if there's a curvature right here, which would be posterior to the stomach, and the spleen sits right over here, so we call this the splitting flexure. Uh, and then the material goes downward here. Uh, and so this would be the descending colon. So when they cut this one out, they didn't get all of the, uh, the large intestine. Uh, so from here, it should curve backward to midline, which would be the sigmoid colon. Then it would terminate in a storage vault that we call the rectum. Uh, and then the opening to the outside would be the anus, all right? All right. So basically, what we can do is we can divide this into cecum, which is this area, colon, which is all of this, and then rectum, and then anal canal. And then we divide the colon itself into ascending, transverse, descending, signal. Okay? And then again, the appendix is this structure. We, we think the appendix was critically important to our existence before we learned to use fire to cook with. So when we're running through the woods trying to eat more raw material, but as we've uh, cooked more and more of our food, the appendix is, is less important to the activity of digestion. Uh, and then the concern with appendicitis is that the chyme entering the cecum from the small intestine has all those digestive enzymes that we made still has enzymes that digest carbohydrates, still has enzymes that digest proteins, still have enzymes that digest lipids, still have enzymes that digest DNA. And so what happens if the appendix ruptures is this chyme exits and goes out into your abdominal cap. And you don't have the mucus that you secrete to protect the lining of the digestive system internally on the outside surface. So when those enzymes are free in your abdominal cavity, you just begin to digest your internal organs inside out from the outside back toward the inside. So that's why uh, a ruptured appendix is deadly because it creates what we call peritonitis, which you actually you begin to self-digest yourself. So that's the same thing with gunshot wounds, knife wounds, uh, perforated, bowel from bones like ribs and stuff and car accidents all lead to death if you don't, if you don't manage it because you, you suffer with this. Then what actually happens when you die is you no longer secrete mucus, but the digestive enzymes are still in the fluid that's inside your digestive system when you pass away. So eventually you begin to digest your own organs internally because you're no longer producing mucus to protect yourself. It's part of the decomposition process. All 
All right. So this is the x-ray I told you about we were talking about in the lab. I said there's a guy that, that was pooping in balls all the time, pooped in balls all his life. And he said, I'm like a weirdo. Nobody else I know poops in balls. So when they eventually did some analysis, they found out he had this enormously long, large intestine. So most people, so here's the cecum over here. Uh, so most people's ascending colon goes up here, transverse colon goes across, but look what his transverse colon is. It goes all the way back down, clear down to the level of his sigmoid colon, and goes all the way back up to the splenic area, and then comes down again. So he has all of this additional uh, large intestine, and that's why his feces was always really dehydrated compared to most people's surface area. Increased absorption. No longer have 10, 100 ml of fluid in your feces, but less. So it's not attached to any sort of mesentery to keep it up there, or it is. But when you when you're developing and you just develop too much, then your mesentery is enlarged as well. Okay. Yeah. And the attachments are different. All right. And so this is a cadaver. Uh, removal of a small intestine here with the ilium entering. Here is actually the cecum, which you can actually see. There's a little appendix off the cecum. And then what we what we did with the models, which the models always make it more obvious, was that we had this white band, which we call the tinea coli. And remember, it's the one that organizes these hostra. So that's what we're seeing right here is the tinea coli, this band right here. And then that's causing these pouches to occur in the hospital rooms. So what's cool, excuse me, this is this is called a barium enema, where they, they inject this fluid uh, via the rectum in, and it makes the, it's opaque, so x-rays don't go through it. And so that's what this stuff is. And it gives you that perfect kind of pattern to the hospital that you can actually see, them, which is really cool. Okay, so in the average person, by the time you've gone from the cecum to the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, back to the rectum, you have about five feet of large intestine that's gone all the way around. Uh, and it's about two, two and a half inches in diameter. So the way it kind of sits in the abdomen is the ascending colon and the descending colon sit clear against your posterior body wall. So they're clear against the posterior body wall. So sometimes the, the parietal peritoneum, the membrane that lines the cavity, goes in front of it. So if the organ is posterior to the parietal peritoneum, then we say it is retroperitoneum. So the two organs that at least I talk about in 241 that were retroperitoneum were our kidneys, and they sit against the posterior body wall. But in most people, the ascending and descending colon are also retroperitoneal. And then the rectum is the last eight inches of the GI tract uh, associated with your sacrum and coccyx. And then the anal canal is the last inch of your GI tract. And we have an internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle and involuntary. And then we have an external sphincter, which is skeletal muscle and voluntary. So we talked about those in the lab on Thursday. So when you're born, the, the nerve brain attachment to the external anal sphincter is incomplete, so you can't control your external anal sphincter, which is why babies are in diapers, because their internal anal sphincter is totally voluntary. It does whatever it wants, whatever it wants, without warning. And so you can't really potty train a child until the connection between the brain and the skeletal muscle maturates so that you can begin to have voluntary control of your external and sphincter. And then you can begin to potty train the child. So it's really kind of cool when you watch little babies maturate because when they're first born, they're kind of blobs. They don't seem to have any control of their, their even their fingers. Then they'll eventually get to where they can pick things up. And it's like really cool. And then they get fascinated. I just love babies watching. <laughs> Is something similar like that true for the urinary system? Do, we, do the babies have control yeah. over that? Yeah, so so urinary is the same way. We have an internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle, and external sphincter, which is skeleton muscle. So we can't control urination either until that maturation process. Thanks.
clothes, which is why we have diapers. Otherwise, we just dribble everywhere. Kind of like when you have little puppies. I need a little puppy. They dribble all over the house. Do yes. they maturate at the same time? Reasonably close, yeah. Okay. To the same time frame. So you use them when you can potty train. You can potty train for urine plus feces. All right. So, so when we're looking at, at the process within the large intestine, then we can divide the movement of material in the large intestine into kind of three, three uh, parts. So hostile churning, peristalsis, and then mass peristalsis. So what actually happens to allow us to continue to facilitate uh, the absorption of water, plus allow bacteria to actually help with absorption of ions plus the creation of some uh, some vitamins that are critically important to us. Then what we do, because the large intestine is compartmentalized in the hostra, is we turn food around in the hostra. So that process of where we're just moving it in each hostra is hostral churning. And that's what actually creates the little balls of feces. So if you really dehydrate your feces, when it gets to you into your rectum, then it doesn't get compressed into the shape of your rectum, which it does in humans. So that's why deer and elk and moose and horses all actually poop in balls is because of the hospital churning. Well, if you've ever taken, so this is my wildlife career, when I, when I was in wildlife biology working for the federal government, when I was a college student, I thought I'd be working with all kinds of cool animals and get to play with them. I spent more time playing with poop than anything else. Because that's how you know what wildlife is eating, because you play with poop. <laughs> so, so if you ever take uh, deer or elk droplets and you cut them, and you looked at them under a microscope, you can actually see that the, the, the vegetation that was not digested is, coil, is all coiled up from the hostile churning. It's actually in a circular pattern inside the little food balls. <laughs> yeah. So, so once we do this for a while, we move it to the next one and do it again. So the movement from one hostra to the next hostra is simple peristalsis. And what we do is we move it from one hostra to the next hostra to the next hostra to the next hostra to the next hostra. And that's the process through the ascending colon and the first part of the transfer colon. And by that point, what we want to do is absorb most of the water so that we've converted our chyme now back to a semi-solid that we call feces. Okay. So now what happens then from the transverse colon on depends on what's going on above it. So if you put a bunch of food in your stomach, when you have a bunch of stuff in your transverse colon, then you're going to get mass peristaltic movements that's going to move everything from your transverse colon into your rectum so that you have room for the material that's coming down. Okay. So, so what we have is we have two reflexes that facilitate the emptying of our large intestine. So new material that's going to come out of our stomach into our small intestine can actually have a place to go. So the gastrocolic reflex is a reflex dealing with the stomach and the large intestine. And so the gastrocolic reflex occurs when you fill your stomach you get this really strong peristaltic wave of motion that causes the contents from your transverse colon to move all the way into your rectum. So that's why in little babies, you, you feed a baby, change a diaper. Because as soon as food enters the stomach, everything from the transverse colon enters the rectum. The rectum gets extended, the distension of the rectum tells the little baby they have to go. And if they're in diapers, there's no control. So as soon as the, so the signal is sent to the brain and said, hey, I've got to go, then the internal anal sphincter relaxes and they poop. So that's that strong connection. 
So the gastroiliac reflex is going to involve the stomach and the small intestine. So that's when the stomach is full. <coughs> the hormone gastrin is going to relax the ileocecal sphincter. The ileocecal sphincter was what controls the emptying of the small intestine into the large intestine. So what you're going to do when you fill your stomach is move contents out of your small intestine into your large intestine, move contents from the transverse colon all the way into your rectum so that you have room for the, for the stuff coming down. So it's kind of cool. Otherwise, peristaltic waves of contraction occur about 3 to 12 contractions per minute. So you, you actually just move it from one ostrich to the next ostrich in, in that pattern, of 3 to 12 per minute. Okay, so what we do is we don't produce any new digestive enzymes with our large intestine. So all the digestive enzymes are either going to be produced by our salivary glands, salivary amylase, our tongue, lingual lipase, our stomach, pepsin, and gastric lipase, and then our pancreas and our small intestine. But that's still in this material. So even though we're not producing any new digestive enzymes, these enzymes are still active as, as the material is going, going through. Okay. And then we have bacteria that we uh, use to help digest uh, material. But because there is no oxygen in the lumen of our large intestine, then when we break down carbohydrates in the absence of oxygen, we do a process called fermentation. And the end product of fermentation in your large intestine is a combination of carbon dioxide and methane gas, which creates gas that we call flavus. So the high tech name for a fart is flavus. So if we eat complex carbohydrates, commonly found in beans, we don't get it digested in our upper digestive system, and bacteria in our large intestine begin to digest those complex carbohydrates. They do it via fermentation, and so we get an, most people get an increase in gas production if they eat complex carbohydrates like beans. Or if you increase the, the amount of fiber in your diet quickly, uh, like cellulose, then you also get an increase in gas. And it's because the bacteria are fermenting. And then you're either going to just keep the gas and expand, 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 or release the gas. Okay. Now, what's amazing, new studies, so the, the, one, the one bacteria we've known for a long time is one of the most studied bacteria in science, which is E. coli, which is a cohabitant of our digestive system. There's a couple of recent scientists who have, who have looked at, at gut contents in terms of bacteria and have now identified at least a thousand species of bacteria that inhabit our large intestine. And to be healthy, you have to have the correct ratio of those bacteria. And so one thing that happens in antibiotic use is when we ingest an antibiotic because we have an infection, it kills the bacteria in our gut as well. So if E. coli populations drop appreciably, then E. coli was creating an environment in your large intestine where uh, the environment inhibited the, the increased population of some of these other thousand bacteria species. So one of the things that can happen, which is real problematic with really heavy antibiotic use, is the person gets diarrhea, and then they get bloody diarrhea, just lose a gob of blood in diarrhea. And that's because the species of bacteria now that are growing in the large intestine are irritating the lining of the large intestine uh, because your E. coli population dropped appreciably. So one of the things that you can find in health food stores now, and the easiest way to do it is active culture bacteria in, in, in yogurt, is to eat yogurt that has active cultures in it. And that replenishes 
the most important of these species of bacteria. So there's a real cool recent study that was just published last year where this guy has started looking at what people eat and what happens to the gut population of bacteria and how the different species are affected by what we eat. And he's actually been able to show that this is really cool. So is that if you can control the gut population of bacteria, you can control the absorption of certain compounds, and you can control weight. All by controlling what populations of bacteria are in your large intestine. Yeah. So it may have it may help explain something we've done, which some people put on weight real easily, even though they don't eat a bunch. And it may all be related to the flora of bacteria that's in their large intestine. And we can use pro probiotics or are a combination of bacteria that we give them to alter the population in the gut and help control weight. Yeah. So recently, it was real. <coughs> just published. All right. So because we use fermentation, we end up with, with carbon dioxide and methane gas. So people have tried to experiment with methane gas and match. You have to be careful because farts will burn. So your hair will be really good. And then what happens is that proteins in particular are digested by the bacteria and create compounds called indoles. So cats in particular are, are carnivorous and cat feces is really stinky because of the amount of indoles in it. So your, di your feces can vary in how much it smells based upon what you're eating as well. So the more high protein diet you eat, the more smelly your feces is because uh, the indole is being produced by bacterial breakdown of proteins that aren't getting digested higher up in your digestive system. All right. And what happens, long story short, which we're going to do in more detail when we get to the liver, is one of the principal roles of your liver is to destroy aging red blood cells. And we produce and destroy about 2 million red blood cells per second in our body. So when, when we destroy red blood cells, we have the compound that helps us carry oxygen that's in our red blood cells called hemoglobin. So uh, what happens with hemoglobin is that it has an iron molecule, and then it's got these phenolic compounds that the iron molecule is attached to, these cyclic hydrocarbons. And then this is called a heme unit. And so this is our, our heme unit. And then this is attached to a big protein molecule. So we have four different protein molecules, two alpha and two beta chains, each with the heme unit. Right? So when we break down red blood cells, we can destroy the, the alpha and beta uh, proteins. And we can convert those back to amino acids, recycle them, remake them. We take the iron because there's no way we could ever get enough iron in our diet if we lost iron all the time. And we attach the iron to a, a transporting protein so that we can send the iron back to our red bone marrow to make new hemoglobin. What we can't do is use these hydrocarbons, these cyclic hydrocarbons. So we can't recycle these. So this part we have to get rid of. So what the liver does is it takes these cyclic hydrocarbon compounds and it converts them to a compound called bilirubin. And then bilirubin is yellow. So in lab on Thursday, we're actually going to use some powdered bilirubin in an experiment. Uh, and you'll see that it's a yellow powder. Well, what happens is the bacteria in our lower gut take bilirubin and convert it to a different compound that is brown. So that's why feces is actually brown, if you never wanted it. See, when I was a kid, it was like, man, I just ate all these beets. Why isn't my poop bright red? But it always is 
various colors of brown because of the building room that we're getting rid of uh, by breaking down red blood cells. And then why do we keep this bacteria in our gut? The critically important thing is the bacteria produces vitamin K and vitamin B. And so that's very critical that we provide this environment for the bacteria to survive in. And so if you actually took enough antibiotics to totally destroy all of the bacteria in your gut, uh, you, would, you would become malnourished over time. Yeah. And then it also then converts time to feces, as we talked about. So a very important organ of large intestine. So when we look at the large intestine, then what we're going to see is another pattern of increasing surface area. So we have these hostra, which are the big folds, which increase surface area. And if we look at the lumen inside of the hostra, then what we're going to see tomorrow in the lab is we've got all these downward folds of the epithelium going downward toward the outside wall of the digestive system. So that even though when we look at it, it looks like this should be the surface, we have this downward folding. So that's what they're demonstrating here. So it's called an intestinal gland, uh, which is found in the large intestine. Now, because we don't produce any new hormones, then we're not going to have the cells like parietal cells that we talked about, or not, excuse me, enzymes. We're going to have the dominance of parietal cells and chief cells like we talked about in the stomach. So what's going to happen is the upper part, again, is going to be dominated by microbilated cells, which are going to be our absorptive cells, which are the ways in which we absorb electrolytes, absorb the vitamin K and vitamin B we just talked about, and absorb the end product, breakdown products of other things that the bacteria do for us. And then as we drop into the gap intestinal gland, it's going to be dominated by goblet cells. So we're going to have lots of mucus droplet cells in there. Uh, in it. And then we're not going to have inter and endocrine cells in the body, so we're not going to produce any hormones as well. So unique to, compared to the stomach and the small intestine, is we have a much more narrow population of cells in our large intestine, where we have microvillated absorptive cells and goblet cells dominating the folding pattern in the, in the uh, large intestine itself. All right, so those absorptive cells are critically important for producing, uh, for absorbing electrolytes, sodium and chloride. So uh, sodium and chloride would come from the food we ingest, but also if you recall what we talked about the other day, um, is that because our mitochondria produce carbon dioxide as a breakdown product of <laughs> carbohydrates for making energy, then when we add the carbon dioxide to the, to the water in our blood, we have an enzyme that helps us form carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid dissociates and forms hydrogen ions plus this bicarbonate ion. And then as the bicarbonate builds up in our blood, because we also have sodium ions in our blood, then the sodium and the bicarbonate come together, ions come together to form this compound which is sodium bicarbonate. Okay, so what the liver and the pancreas does is release sodium bicarbonate as a buffer to convert the kind coming out of our stomach from pH 2 to 7 so that the small intestine functions. So we're losing a lot of sodium because we're using it as a buffer. So it's very important in our large intestine that we reabsorb that those electrolytes. So when you have diarrhea, not only are you losing water at a rapid rate, but you're losing electrolytes at a rapid rate. And that's why Pedialyte is so critical to babies uh, if they have diarrhea, is because it replaces the electrolytes that are being lost as well. That's why if you're really bad, you have to use IVs to, to, to 
get water and electrolytes back in the summer if they've had really bad diuretic events, could lead, which lead to death, because we're losing all these electrolytes. So after about three to 10 hours of movement through the large intestine, about 90% of the water has been re removed from the chyme, and that results in the formation of feces, which is a semi-solid uh, material that, that uh, begins to form in the transverse colon. And then feces contains dead epithelial cells. So there have actually been criminals who didn't flush a toilet after a crime who've been caught because you can do DNA analysis on feces and find out who it came from. <coughs> those, those are people that shouldn't be calling being criminals. <laughs> and then undigested food material. So you can also do DNA analysis and find out who's been eating whom in, in all like biology and other things. There's actually a guy in, at the University of Washington who's been looking at bear populations in the Northern Cascades, and he collects bear feet. <laughs> He's been able to identify the bears that drop the feet and track them based on their feces, and also what they've been eating, all because of the DNA. And then cellulose and obviously bacteria. That's one of the reasons why feces is so problematic, and we have to manage it with sewer treatment plants, is the amount of bacteria that's actually in the feces. So the world has changed dramatically. If you went back to the early to mid-1800s and you lived in New York City, there was no sewer system. There were no toilets. Because the gentleman in the gentleman in England who created the toilet, his name was Crapper. <laughs> that's why, that's where that claim to take a crap comes from. Because this guy who created the toilet's name was Crapper. <laughs> then you have chamber pots. You know what they used to do is open the windows and throw it in the street. And then people got really sick when they lived in big cities to very small towns. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess I'm going to